beautiful day it is to be in the house of the Lord. We've been talking about what does it mean to be a Pentecostal powerhouse. And when we look at it from that aspect, we're looking at it from the aspect of the individual who works out all the time, goes to the gym all the time, gets really, really buff. But we're looking at it and comparing it to the spiritual, about us becoming powerhouses and mighty with God. When we look at the person who goes to the gym, we realize that that doesn't happen overnight. You don't go to the gym once and poof, you have the perfect body or the perfect muscles or the perfect shape. But rather, it takes time. It takes consistency. It takes work. And it takes focus. Because the person who has really large arms, they are focusing on arms. The person who's strengthened his back, they focus on back. That's why you have a leg day, an arm day, and so on and so on. When it comes to us as Pentecostals, we need to become mighty in the things of God. One thing I love about God, ever work at a workplace and they tell you to do something, but they never give you the equipment or the tools to do it. Somehow they expect you to magically just get it done. I've been there and I've done that and I've had that with no equipment. They want you to magically get it done. But God's not like that. He's given us all the tools that we need to do the job and more. It's just a matter of us getting a hold of them and learning how to use them. When it comes to us as Christians, we start talking about faith. Because every area of life, it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not, faith is required. If we are going to see God move, it takes faith. Faith is something that is supernatural. But faith does have an enemy. Does anybody remember what the enemy of faith is? It is doubt. Doubt is the enemy of faith. When we and uh, just elaborate on that a little bit more, what do I mean by doubt and what, it being the enemy of faith? We love to use the uh, back it up. We love to use the illustration of how this demon does. Some demons don't come out but by prayer and fasting. We talk about that. We use the example of Jesus coming out of the wilderness. But before Jesus even told the ants the that answer to the disciples. Before he told them that this kind comes out not by prayer and fasting, when they asked Jesus why this demon would not come out, what did Jesus say? Because you doubt it. And then he went on to explain. Doubt is the enemy of faith. We looked at men and women throughout history and saw their exploits because of faith, because of prayer, and because of fasting. The person that has faith, we need to move on and focus on prayer. Because prayer is the most unutilized weapon in the Christian arsenal. When was the last time that anyone remembers even going to a prayer meeting? And I don't say that in a bad way, but when was the last time anyone heard of a prayer meeting being advertised? Why? Because everyone gets so focused on the here and now, on us, on me, myself, and I, that they don't realize the power of prayer. And if they don't realize the power of prayer when it comes to a prayer meeting, how much are people really praying in their own lives? Now we need to realize that there's power in prayer. And when we come to that realization, it's going to change every facet of our Christian walk, including the faith aspect. But if we really, really want to get a hold of God, and I mean really, really show them that we're serious, what do we have to couple with prayer? Prayer. Fast. And if people don't like to pray, guess how much more they like to fast? Because that requires sacrifice. If we really want to get a hold of God, it's a matter of showing Him that we're sold out to Him. That we are sacrificing of ourselves to see God answer. I remember when I was in Bible school. We would have had to go to prayer Every morning, every evening, excluding Saturdays. I think we had Saturday night, but not Saturday morning. That was the only time we didn't come and join corporately for prayer in the morning. Maybe Sunday mornings. With that all set aside, you know what I found? 
I could pray as much as I wanted to when we gathered together for mandatory prayer in the morning. I could pray, Brother Eli, as much as I wanted to in the evening prayers as well. But it's when I went above and beyond to show God that I was setting aside a time from Him. Time out of my own schedule. I was going above and beyond to try to get a hold of Him. That's when I really feel, felt God come down in me. Why? It wasn't because I wasn't praying. No, we prayed all the time practically. But I was showing God that I was going above and beyond. I was doing more than was required to try to get a hold of him. Now, more than likely, I am sure here at church, we don't meet every morning for prayer, every evening for prayer. But if we would pray in our own personal life and couple that with prayer, it shows God that we're going above and beyond whatever we want to do, whatever we have to do, to try to get a hold of him. We are sacrificing of ourselves that we may meet him. And when we do that, God pays, pays, pays special attention to it and makes note of it because we are doing, we are seeking and chasing after him. And as a result, he must fulfill his word, which his word states. Does anybody have any verses about chasing after God? Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. It's a promise. So if we chase after God, you'll come down and meet us. So a couple of prayer, um, fasting with prayer, and we have a powerful weapon. Now we're going to start talking about this a little bit more, and we're going to make a transition into the armor of God. Because like I said earlier, God's not like a, a fleshly corporation. He's not like some a work someone we may work for down here. He's given us all the tools that we need to fulfill the task and more. And he's not just given us just what we need, but he's God above and beyond. He said that he would send the comforter. He said the Holy Ghost. But he's also given us other gifts as well. And we'll talk about the Holy Ghost in the future. But would someone please read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And someone else, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Ephesians 6, verse 11. Whoever gets Ephesians 6, or verse 11, just hold that. We'll be reading uh, another passage. I'll have you read one more verse of that later. But does someone have 2 Corinthians 10, and verse 4? For the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but ways through God, to pull them down. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What about Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11? careful, be vigilant, for we have an adversary of the devil who is walking around seeking whom he may devour. So God already gives us a heads up. Hey, somebody's been out to get you. Someone's out to pull you down. Someone's out to devour you. And it's clear who, we're, who our enemy is. But, in Ephesians chapter 6 and 11 verse 12, God points out that we're in a battle. We're in a war. What, what does that read, brother? Ephesians 6, 11. I know you read that, but we read that verse and verse 12 as well, please. For the whole world of God, that you may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. For we 
So it's not that we just have an enemy, but he has soldiers working with the principalities, powers, thrones, dominions. And guess what? They are all coming after you. But God told us to put on the whole armor of God. What's the purpose of armor? For protection. What are we protecting? If we have armor on, what's the purpose of armor? What are we protecting? Our lives. Um, more specifically, to break it down, we have vital organs. If you shoot me through the heart right now, more likely, I'm going to die. So what do we get? We get a breastplate. We have something that goes over the chest. There are several vital organs in the chest. We have the heart. We have the lungs. We have the liver. So we want to make sure that we don't get a fatal blow. Another place you might get a, a fatal blow, to the head. Unfortunately, um, well, I don't even go there. I don't, but regardless, one of the fatal blows is to the head. You get hit in the temples, you can get killed. So God's given us a helmet. Someone slices your ankle or the back or your leg or something, you might slice the right tendon, and you can't walk. God's given us armor. It's not just enough to be at war with somebody. But he's given us armor for protection. So he's given us the Holy Ghost to help us, but he's also given us armor in this uh, battle against the enemy. If we, why are we so familiar with armor? Because it's been something that's been created all throughout history for the most part. And it was used for protection. If we, we start studying the history of armor, there's leather armor, there's metal armor, there's chain mail. Throughout the years, you'll see it progress and maybe go from one sheet of metal to chain mail leather. By explaining you, you're more able to move. Maybe you'll get a helmet that makes you able to see farther on more sides. You know, shields have changed, you know, where one said by been used to block something to the whole Roman um, army where they lock shields and place them in the ground to hold spire, it progressed. God uses things to try to illustrate to us through the natural, to illustrate to us spiritual truth that we may understand it. And he tells us we have an enemy, but don't worry, I've given you armor, I've given you tools. But they're not like any other tools of this world. They're spiritual. If someone would agree, I'll go ahead and find 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17, verses 38 and 39. First Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 and 39. And the Bible states, And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. He also armed him with a coat of mail, and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. If anybody wants to take a guess, what is going on in this situation? He's getting ready to kill Goliath. And Goliath is coming out day in and day out and taunting Israel. They had an enemy. They had the Philistines. But they had this big old giant that came out taunting them every day. Notice that the armies were behind Goliath, but they weren't on the field with Goliath. Goliath was picking a battle. He was the kid on the playground that kept poking you with a stick or kept throwing rocks at you. You know, he was out there to make fun of you, to taunt you, to try to scare you. He was the guy who'd come out from behind you without looking and giving you noogies. And Saul knew that something had to be done about this boy. And no one's willing to confront him. And David says, I'll go. So what does Saul do? 
No, David, I'll give you my own personal armor. So Saul gives, gives him his, his helmet, his chain mail. And notice that Saul gave David his sword. At this time, there weren't that many swords in Israel. There really weren't. The only one that I'm aware of being mentioned is Saul's at this time. So he gives David his only sword to try and vanquish the foe. David says, I can't use these. They don't work for me. Why don't they work for David? Well, that would be like Brother Harry trying to try on my armor, or I'm trying on Brother Craig's, or um, Brother Eli's. You know, everyone's built differently. Each soldier had their armor made speci specifically for them. If Saul was taller than David, guess what? That helmet might have been hanging down a little bit below his eyes. That chainmail might have been dragging on the ground a little bit. That sword might have been too heavy for David to lift up. Or maybe it was clumsy and awkward. No one has, David never used a sword before. He used a sling and a shield, a sling and a staff. But wielding a sword is entirely different. Maybe it was big, maybe it was bulky. Maybe David tried, would try sling it, but the edge, you could hear it growling on the ground in the stones. It wasn't his armor. It wasn't made for him. It wasn't designed for David. What are we talking about? Saul's armor was a physical armor. It didn't work for David. It didn't fit his size. No, God doesn't have a, a physical armor. He has a, a spiritual armor. And it is designed for each one of us. It fits each one of us perfectly. Why is it spiritual and not physical? First of all, and I might not even go by right now, so we'll see where we're at. But regardless, why is it spiritual and not physical? Because you're comparing apples and oranges. Ever hear that when you're growing up in school? You can't add apples and oranges. You can't do this and you can't do that. You can't mix multiplication in with division uh, until you get to algebra, then they completely confuse you. But you can't, it's like comparing apples and oranges. It's not the same thing. You can't compare Dennis to me. You can't compare Mom to me. You might, to a degree, that's a little bit of a different story. But you can't compare apples and oranges. It's not the same thing. You cannot fight a spiritual body battle in the flesh. You can't do it. And the devil comes up, you can't physically punch him. Why? Because he's not fleshly. So God has given us a spiritual, a spiritual arm because we cannot fight him in the flesh. Also, when you look at it being a spiritual weapon versus a physical weapon, our armor grows with us. The more powerful we get at God, the more powerful our weapons are. The more powerful our armor is. If we're a weak Christian, well, then our armor is going to be weak. Not going to take much to get through it. But our relationship with God determines not only the effectiveness of the weapon, but how familiar we are with it. Ever see an old person with new technology? I'll be honest. There are some people out there they just should not have computers. They shouldn't have smartphones. They should stay far, far away from them. I remember just a few months ago and I got Beth her first smartphone. Got it all set up for her. Made sure that it worked. Somehow, within half an hour, she managed to block me from messaging her the next day. How she did it, I don't know. We got it resolved. But there are a lot of people out there that are like that with technology. You know, they just don't know how to do it. You're looking at me for I have no idea how you blocked me from messaging in a half an hour when you had to go through like five steps. She might have wanted to do that. She might have because I had to fix it the next day. She's very smart. <laughs> But the more you use something, the better you get. 
What we do the same thing with at work. You know, how often does somebody come into work there, brother Craig, that sees you do something, you just go right through the motions and it looks like nothing, and then they go to try and do it, and what took you five minutes and uh, ended up being an hour for them because they're not familiar with it. What they have to realize is when you first started, you wouldn't really know how long it took you to practice it. You know, I get people coming out at work that if you make it look so easy, you can get it done like that. It takes them longer. Because I've done that a lot more. Now, that doesn't change things with the spiritual. The more we pray, the more we learn how to pray. The more we use our faith, the more we learn how to believe God and use our faith. That is supernatural. The more that the enemy comes in like a flood, and the more that we learn how to defeat that attack, the next time he comes in that way, we can get rid of him a whole lot quicker because we are aware of that attack. The reason I say that is sometimes the devil comes in and he sounds just like us. And we don't catch it right away. But next time when he comes in with the same, no, I know who that is. Why? Because we've been there. We've done that. We're familiar with it. How do we get familiar with uh, And that's why our, our weapons are spiritual. The more familiar we get with them, the more powerful they are with them. The person who gets up and goes into an archery competition, that doesn't happen overnight. That takes practice. The more that we pray, the more that we fast, the more we read our Bible, the more we use our spiritual weapons or practicing with them. And the more we use them, the better we get. If we would start really comparing the armor of God with Saul's armor, we can see that they were both given by kings. Saul was the king of Israel. He had an enemy coming in against him. But he wanted to send somebody else to fight his battles. He equipped him, but it wasn't with the right equipment because it didn't work for David. But when it comes to us and our weaponry, they're given to us by the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The, some of the greatest generals of all time <coughs> were great for one reason. They were not afraid of a battle. Why did Napoleon Bonaparte's men follow him to such great extents? Because he was willing to be right out there in the front of the battle with them. Why did Alexander the Great inspire so many people to follow him? Because he was right there on the front leading the battle. These men were not afraid to go into the bloodiest, most dangerous parts. Why? Because that's what they expected everybody else to do. They led by example. And because of that, they were revered and followed. Saul didn't want to fight his battle. And what was the song? Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Why? Because David was fighting his battles. We are going to have to fight that. But our king has already given the example and has already led the way. He's gone before us. When it came to Calvary, he made the way down into hell himself, took on the enemy, and then went over into paradise, and then led all those captive prisoners free. If we look into the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, what was the vision of of David, of Jesus that Isaiah had. His, throat, his train filled the temple. That wasn't a wedding train. That was a royal train. What would happen back then is when a king conquered another king, he would cut off his train and have it sewn to his. So the more battles and wars that they won, the longer the train would get. God's, Christ's train fills the temple. What does that mean? It means exactly what he said in his word. That he has already defeated the enemy. He's already defeated every single battle, battle that we're going to come up against. And he's overcome. And because of that, we can follow his example and press on. Also, when we look at that, uh, uh, Kings in comparison... David went in to soothe Saul from time to time when he was tried by an evil spirit. He didn't really rank 
It might have ranked high, but not high enough to co-reign with Saul. But what did Jesus say? He has seated us with him in heavenly places. Everything that he's inherited and conquered, we get to enjoy that because of what he's done and who he is. We've already talked about how Saul's armor was dead. It was physical. You could put Saul's armor in water all you want and it was not going to grow. Ever see these totality put in water and all of a sudden it grows into a shape of an animal or something or it takes on another form and it becomes larger and larger and larger? When we were in Bible school, somebody actually got themselves a husband pill or something like that. Our husband, a girl, a husband, I think it was, put in water and it grows and grows and grows. Saul's armor wasn't like that. It was how large it was and that's all there was to it. The only way to shrink it was to cut it off or melt it down or something. It didn't change upon individual. But God's armor is spiritual. And it fits perfectly for us. It is not fleshly. We find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. What does 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 read? We've already got it on my back. Well, I have it in my notes. I didn't get it printed off today. But 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of the stronghold. Why? Because the power that we get comes from God. And our weapons are designed just for us. They're spiritual. When we look at Saul's armor, they were natural. They were clumsy for David. Like I said, they didn't fit them the way that they should have. They didn't have the range of motion. And as much metal and brass as there was, if David would have been smaller than Paul. And Saul, who was at no time surnamed Paul, but Saul, what happens when you get weight on your shoulders? That's too heavy for you. It slows you down. You can't move easily. Or maybe you're just kind of stuck in one position because if you move any direction, you're going to fall over. I don't know how Saul's armor was for David. I really don't. But I do know it was not made for him. It did not fit right. And because of that, it would not have been really effective for David's use. What did it have protected him? More than likely, would it have stopped uh, Goliath if he got close and tried to hurt? Not really, because David couldn't run fast, or maybe he wouldn't have been moved, or maybe the breastplate was as tall as David and it was just stuck there on the ground. One good kick and he would have got punted like football. I don't think that was the case, but still. They're comparing apples and oranges. Saul's armor was not made for David, and therefore it was not really effective. Saul's helmet was made of brass. And brass in the Bible is representative of judgment. We can see that in the tabernacle. There was uh, the brazen altar where animals were sacrificed. Why was the altar made of brass? Because it was a place of judgment. Israel was being judged, and that's where they had to sacrifice their animals. And Saul's armor depended solely upon the flesh. What does Romans chapter 8, verse 7 say? Romans 8, 7.